For those unfamiliar, there is a subgenre of horror content on YouTube known as analog horror, which is horror content that aims for the aesthetic that analog technology creates, such as that made by VHS tapes. What started as trying to capture the uncanny feeling during an old broadcast or an emergency alert turned into a popular genre, which would be what some consider its undoing. One of the most commonly cited examples of this degradation is a series on the YouTube channel Urban Spook called The Painter. The series is awful as we'll go over, but the creator is also delusionally defensive of his slop. But even that's ambiguous. That's only part of why people make fun of Urban Spook, the worst YouTube horror series. To criticize the series, it is essential that we not only know the series, but also what it's all trying to get at. The first episode of the painter titled Faces starts the series off by introducing the simple premise. A serial killer is at large and he makes paintings detailing the methods which he kills his victims. The episode starts when the police find three paintings in a storage unit that tie to three recent murders. The first victim, Carla, was found with 36 stab wounds and had all her teeth removed. Her painting titled Carla's Teeth showing a character with exaggerated teeth. It's symbolic in a way. The second victim, Jackie, was stabbed 27 times in the taint, living through the stabbing but ultimately dying to being drowned. Her painting titled Floating Jackie is of a, you know, a body in red water. It's less symbolic and a little more literal than the last one. The final victim of this episode is James, whose face was pulled off and his wrist slid open. His painting was titled James's Secret Face, and it entails a dude just pulling his face off. The episode continues by showing other paintings that haven't been connected to other murders yet. These being Wax Doll Tom, Lisa's Secret Face, Hanging Jimmy, Fuck Toy Cory, Daniel After the Fire, Jennifer's Last Air, and Scream Maggie Scream. We then get shown photos of James, Jackie, and a Jimmy, who we have a painting of but police haven't found. The episode ends with a painting called Self-Portrait, which represents the killer. Here we can already see some of the problems with the series. The series claims to be that of a police investigation, and the tapes appear to be made by the police department, so what I'm really wondering is, where is any of the insight into the investigation? We get descriptions of how these victims died, and we get to see these spooky paintings, but we don't get much detailing of the actual police activity. Since this is the first episode, though, it could just be a case of first episode syndrome, where the first episode is just kind of mid compared to the rest of us, but let's see if that gets any better. Episode 2 named The Lighthouse starts off in the deep, talking about the police officer named Bill Collins who's found the self-portrait from episode 1 in his own house. Him and his family have gone missing, and in searching for him, they found his two-month-old daughter hanging in the attic. Her painting was titled Long Necked Angel, and it was found in the family car, just found on the ocean side, I guess. Police eventually took their search to a lighthouse which was out of commission, finding a painting on the door. Inside they found the burnt corpse of a teen named Daniel, which gives us a connection to Daniel after the fire. Venturing further into the tunnels under the lighthouse, finding the corpses of Jennifer and Lisa White, who are represented by a couple previous paintings from the last episode. Police end up finding a barrel filled with meat and bones who are made of the rest of the Collins family. Photos were apparently taken of the family before death, and they're shown right here. A fourth photo is shown, which bears striking resemblance to the self-portrait. If you've heard of this series, you've almost certainly heard about this episode. Episode 3, titled In the Walls, details the disappearance of two 11-year-old twins, Corey and Margaret Beck, and how five days after their disappearance, they were found inside an abandoned factory. Despite being considered found, only the top half of Margaret and the bottom half of Corey were found. The halves were stitched together when their respective other halves have yet to be found. Margaret's neck and jaw were broken with a brick being shoved down her throat. The brick had the word meat written on it. Corey's cock and balls were pulled off his body by force. In case you haven't made the connection, these two paintings are Fuck Toy Corey and Scream Maggie Scream. A week before Corey's disappearance, he had been dared to go into a spooky cabin and was met by a face. He took photos of the inside of the cabin and were shown the photos. The last one seeming to be the picture from the self-portrait. I skipped talking about episode 2 in depth so that I could use them both to just talk about the main grievance with this series that I'm sure you can understand at this point. Series hasn't really learned from its first episode and still doesn't really give any insight into what the police are doing, and instead just wants to talk about all the gruesome murders that took place. It's not an unpopular opinion to find the series not scary at all, and there's a point at which something is so shocking that it actually just isn't even scary anymore. If anything, it's actually kind of funny. Fuck Toy Cory has actually just become an in-joke with my friends and I because just of how goofy it is. 
It, if Urban Spook wanted to make a horror series so shocking it just ends up being funny, then he really hit the spot. But something tells me that wasn't really his goal, and I'll get to that later. Another nitpick I have with the story is what it shows as photographs. The photos that Corey Beck took are clearly like real photographs, and then you compare that to the photos that are just found of people before death. And you know, that ruins immersion for me. You know, fuck Toy Corey, I can stay immersed in that. Episode 4, The Clue, tells us that an investigator named Sean went missing, and the last body he found before his disappearance was that of a Tom Harris. It was found that the killer climbed up Tom's drain pipe and went into his bedroom window. A pile of wax was found in the living room, and inside was the body of Tom, who had died of suffocation from the wax. We can't just have him suffocate from the wax, though. His arms and eyelids were cut off, and for some reason there's a third arm in the pile of wax with an unknown owner. The painting Wax Doll Tom from Episode 1 gets solved, leaving us with only Hanging Jimmy. Back to the investigator Sean, though. He went missing, and the police found Sean's dog in his apartment with all her legs broken, but, you know, she was still alive. Blood was found trailing to the kitchen, the only clue police found being the number two written in blood by Sean. A new painting named The Man in the Pipes was found in Sean's bedroom. Security footage managed to snap a picture of the killer, and this is it. The next installment witness is more of the same. A girl named Tina and her sister Flora are taken on a road trip by Tina's boyfriend Jack. Wouldn't you know it, they go missing and Jack's car is found with a painting in it titled Flower Face Flora obviously alluding to Tina's sister. Tina's found alive, but her arms and feet are cut off. Flora, however, was found with her head smashed by a hammer. This is fine for police to show, I guess, because, you know, there it is. Tina says the killer is still near, and though police can't find him, another painting is found titled Long Jack, which had just been put in Jack's car while the police were away. Jack's still not found. We get a sketch of the killer's face, which just about lines up with everything we've seen thus far. Okay, this one's a little wild. Episode 6, Pig, starts off by telling us that a former police officer named Ian Ford and his wife May have gone missing. Police find May at a barn, handcuffed, though her hands had been ripped off her body, and was found badly mangled, but autopsy showed she was dead from internal bleeding. A dead horse was found in the barn from a sildenafil overdose. Sildenafil, for those who don't know, that's Viagra. The head of the Ford's granddaughter was found, and it's shown right here. In other stall of the barn, faces were nailed to the walls, some belonging to previous victims. Also, there were some decapitated pigs, but in the middle of this stall was a giant pig that was sliced open and stitched back together. Inside the pig was Ian Ford's body, and inside the pig's eye sockets were the eyes of Fiona Ford, the granddaughter. In the tack room, the rest of Fiona's body was found along with some paintings. We get shown the painting Breeding Mount May, which is meant to represent May Ford. In case the dead horse from a Viagra overdose and May's death being from internal bleeding wasn't enough, it's now capital C clear that she was fucked to death by this horse. <laughs> Ian the pig has a double meaning because Ian Ford was a cop, but also because he was stuffed inside a pig after his death. Four Holes Fiona is just a, a painting of Fiona's head with her eyes coming out. Here's hoping Four Holes doesn't refer to any fuck toy Cory type activities, but with this series it almost definitely is. Other paintings we get are Wet Skin George, The Jigsaw Baby, Blowhole Isabel, Hide and Zeke, Breathless Janice, Fleshhead Fred, Teen of the Witness, and Observing Paul. Teen of the Witness we can already connect to the last episode. A tape is also found that's heavily damaged, but miraculously the footage gets to be recovered, which is the footage you're seeing right now. Episode 7, Family, opens with some more murders. The first victim shown is a teacher named Isabel, who called the police as she was attacked, but the address she gave them led police to a different scene. Police were led to a house belonging to a family of three people named Janice, Paul, and Zeke. The family was expecting another child in a few months. Janice and Paul, the husband and wife, were found executed in the kitchen with the fetus ripped out of Janice. Janice had been strangled with the umbilical cord. Paul was found dead, tied to the kitchen counter a few feet from Janice. The fetus had been spread around the house, and Paul was found to be dead of asphyxiation after the head of the unborn daughter was shoved down his throat. Zeke is missing. 
But, you know, given the, the, the painting Hide and Seek, it's, I'm sure you can guess. A painting was found in the house with the title mostly being scratched out except for pipes. The Pipes painting is a little ambiguous at the moment as to who that is, though. Some theorize it's Sean from episode 4, because he's the man in the pipes, and it kind of looks like him. Already we have four paintings from the last episode, with Observing Paul, Breathless Janice, Hide and Zeke, and The Jigsaw Baby. Isabel Jackson from the beginning of the episode's house is tracked down. There they find the body of a Bruce Jackson stabbed seven times, and where one would expect to find his head a painting lay in its stead. I guess that's the language police reports use now. The painting called Infinite Ma Bruce is shown and Isabel's is found dead with a hole being drilled through her frontal lobe. A note was put inside of her blowhole, which yeah, this murder is the painting uh, blowhole Isabel. The note says, I live where I can't breath, and I eat without teeth, what am I? Well, there are two answers to this riddle, one being a whale because they can't breathe underwater and they eat without teeth. They technically have baleen, uh, which could just be like a little, a little, a little cruel remark at Isabel. Uh, the other answer would be just a, a fetus because they, they, you know, you you can't breathe in the womb and they don't eat with their teeth. So you know you can go with either one of those answers, but. The important part is two sets of footprints were found at the scene, indicating more than one murderer, which is what Sean's blood f drawing from episode 4 was alluding to. The audio of Isabel's phone call is played, which is the first voice acting we've ever gotten in the series. And that's how the episode ends. Uh, it's probably a really cold take, but this is actually just the best moment of the series. All we've had thus far is just gory descriptions of murders of random people and sometimes some unsettling paintings. It was finally a breath of fresh air to hear more than just scary music play in the background and read white text on a screen. I think if the series leaned more into this aspect, an actual showing without telling, then it could be improved a lot. At the time of making this video, there's only one episode left and it's titled Meat. A doctor named Fred is murdered in his own home, and neighbors heard a dog barking from his house, even though Fred only owned a cat. Police enter Fred's house and find evidence of a struggle in the kitchen and lots of Viagra. Fred had no skin on his head, and the floor was riddled with sandpapers. Fred's cat couldn't be found, but a painting was found seemingly portraying the cat called Pocket Pussy. Fred's painting was found a while back with Fleshhead Fred, and we get the development that the painters are zoophiles too. Seems they skinned George and Shane Dawson as cat, but you know, that's paid no mind I guess as we move on to the man named George who was found killed in his home. Barking was also heard during this attack for some reason. The body was so fucked up that it was hard to identify him. George's face had been cut off, he was stabbed 487 times, four of these wounds were fucked and photos were found inside of his body. George's murder is, of course, what skinned George from pigs. A police dispatcher named Sarah and her husband Michael got abducted too. A security camera captured the killers entering Sarah's home, and this is the first time we get to see video from, well, from security camera footage. I mean, we get like actual like film, but this is the first like actual like animated video. And that's it for the series thus far. 
there are going to be more episodes and the series is not finished yet so I can't review it as if it's a whole, but so far the series does deserve its negative reputation. It's all just like shock value for the sake of shock value and I really can't respect that. The lack of storytelling leaves a dry taste in my mouth that I wish could be resolved. I'm no Nostradamus of storytelling, but I'm also not making a horror series to a dedicated 90,000 subscribers. The story peaked in its shock value with Fucktoy Cory, since he was not only a child, but was also mutilated and raped judging by the title. The only reason I don't find Four Whole Fiona more shocking is that there's no implied sexual assault. I'm not ruling it out, but at least Four Whole Fiona gives some ambiguity. This series' shock value problem transcends Fucktoy Cory, though. In the case of George and his 400 stab wounds, four of which being fucked, and his cat being skinned and fucked, as well as Paul being forced to eat his own unborn daughter, or even the case of May being fucked to death by a horse, you know, these are all examples of this aspect. If the series was more grounded and focused on the police investigation or included more live elements such as the phone call or security footage, I could see this series actually being good. It's such a shame because the idea of a serial killer that makes paintings of his victims and leaves them around is such a good premise that it's so utterly botched in its execution. I only talked about all these episodes as opposed to just the most shocking ones to show how repetitive the series gets. A criticism I see of Urban Spook critics is that they don't look at the whole series, which, to their credit, the only big, all the big critique videos I've ever seen really only talk in depth about In the Walls and Pigs. And I've talked about everything to ensure you're not missing anything special by only watching those two. I watched the whole series hoping to change my mind, but fundamentally it's the same every episode. In case you haven't noticed a pattern, every episode throws you into the deep about a recently abducted or missing person, and then goes into painstaking amount of detail describing the conditions in which, uh, not said missing people die, because sometimes we just cut to completely different people, which gets really confusing sometimes. Uh, then we get paintings of them. Sometimes we get a painting in advance and have to put it together ourselves, which makes for an interesting puzzle, and I kind of like doing that. You know, if you noticed a lack of analysis, that would be because there's not much to analyze. Everything is given to you, and every mystery that comes up is solved like an episode later. There's no, like, connecting puzzles that lead you to find, like, cool easter eggs or anything like that. It's all just kind of given to you. There's no, there's nothing left up to guesswork. Someone who likes to analyze the stuff they watch isn't going to get a lot from this series. Uh, the most interesting activity you have is putting the painting to the name, but, you know, that's, that's pretty easy, honestly. I know this is not a super, like, uncommon take, but one thing I actually need to give him credit on is the fact that he makes all the paintings himself and he makes all the music he uses in his series himself. As someone who dabbles in all of that stuff, it takes, you know, it takes a lot of effort to do some shit like that. And that's why I find it so disappointing that the story that ties it all together is so lackluster. Because everything else, the music, the paintings, you know, the, the art, all of it is pretty damn good. It, you know, like, look at the look at the pig painting, like, that shit's unsettling as fuck. But then you look at the story that ties it all together, and it all kind of ruins it. If you made, like, a good story to tie everything together, this would be pretty epic. But we can't live in that reality, I guess. In the beginning of this video, I said that the creator of this series is oddly defensive of the stuff he's made. And I called that... Uh, defensiveness ambiguous and that's because his story changes every single time he talks about it the whole hate train started when a twitter interaction happened and i'm sure you already know this one a tweeter said what's an analog slash digital horror opinion that'll get you like this a youtuber named pastor replied saying we need to stop praising series that rely entirely on shock value to carry their horror Stuff like Urban Spook drives me nuts, because the only horror it has relies entirely on trying to describe the most vile possible thing with little else. Which I would say is a pretty accurate summation of what we've talked about thus far. But Urban Spook didn't take too kindly to this. He replied to this saying, You're such a fucking pussy. Just because extreme horror doesn't fit into your little autistic furry horror taste doesn't mean that there isn't a place for it. Use your platform to talk about things you like instead of shitting on actual creators, cunt. Not the, it's not the most civilized response I've, I've ever seen, but, you know, all, all things considered, it could have gone a lot worse. And this response was uh, you know, an optics nightmare for him. At this point, a lot of people in the analog horror community found him to be a 
piece of shit who doesn't really make great content, which, you know, I have my reservations about calling it all bad, as you've heard, but yeah, I, I can't help but agree because of how defensive he's being here. In a Reddit thread talking about this Twitter exchange, Urban Spook actually replied saying, Pastor is a rat. This isn't the first time he talks shit. Maybe I went a little hard. I don't know. I'm sure you're aware that there's been an extreme amount of hate lately. I guess this kinda was the last straw for me. This isn't the first fairly big content creator that basically says I shouldn't have a place in the community simply because I do extreme horror. As I've said it before, I'll keep calling this series Analog Horror for its consistency. But as soon as it's done, I'm drawing myself away from the analog horror community. I'll keep making horror content on the channel, though. I really try to focus on all you guys who support my work instead. But it's hard sometimes, especially since I'm fairly new to this. So please know that I appreciate you all so much. And here we have it. He was under a lot of pressure at the time, and therefore he snapped when he really shouldn't have. Whether he regrets it or not is kind of in the air. But as you can see, this is very clearly not something he'd ever do. Uh, this is just an isolated incident because everything's been stacking up so much, despite the fact that he really hadn't been getting that much hate at this point. But you know, any amount of hate can be a lot to someone who's just starting out making content who's not used to all the attention. But here we have here where he's kind of molding about the hate he's been getting. Urban spook haters when horror is meant to be horrifying. And it's just a picture of Fuck Toy Cory. Or, or, or here, where we have someone who doesn't really like Urban Spook just posting a picture of someone saying, why does everyone hate this analog horror series? Just with the, with the very crass reply, cause it's dog shit. And Urban Spook just replies saying, heh, you're a furry. I don't even know if I'd say that this OP is a furry. I mean, it, they've got an animal in their profile picture, but that's very clearly a animatronic character from the Walton Files. They might just be a Walton Files fan, you know? But I guess animal and picture equal furry equal degenerate. I, we're still stuck in 2016, I guess. I have no clue the context behind what he's even saying here with Chez Who, but someone, you know, I assume Chez says, no idea, man, stay spooky, clearly trying to be like a good sport about uh, being basically called irrelevant by Urban Spook here. And Urban Spook can't even stay a good sport. He just says, lol, ain't no fucking way this is some horror project. I thought this was just another autistic kid with his persona as PFP Lamau. Which, you know, really going out of his way to make everyone hate him. Like, like this guy's trying to be nice to you and you're, ju and you're just doing this shit. It's like, it, there's, a, there's a reason no one respects this guy. And behavior like this is how you could just end up even more hated. Like, you don't make your series good, you do all the shit yourself, which lends you some props, but because you do that, you feel entitled to just talk shit about everybody who has a problem with the lack of story writing that is Fuck Toy Cory. Like, you know, anyone could come up with Fuck Toy Cory in their head. Could anyone come up with- well, I'm sure a lot of people could come up with The Walton Files, actually, it's a pretty basic story. But the Walton Files at least is good. For how derivative the Walton Files is, it's actually good. But here we have the last thing I want to talk about, and that's Urban Spook's comment under the Wendigoon video, where he basically does nothing but lambast the Urban Spook series. Where he says, Wow, I can't wrap my head around the fact that you actually made a video talking about something I created. Even if it's not necessarily in a good light, it's still surreal to me since I've watched your content for some time. Here's some things I really want to clarify. I have no idea where you've heard that I don't care about my series or that I only make it to sell shirts. That's not true. I made the first couple episodes just for fun, but since it blew up, I really want to improve and try my hand at something new for each episode, like animation or voice acting. I age-restricted myself for episode 6 since this was around the time I realized there's a lot of kids watching my series. The painter is intended for an 18 plus audience. I had no idea that so many young people in the community were watching when I started. Also, the episode was planned out way before any controversy started. It was not a response to angry people on Twitter. Speaking of, please don't take anything I do on Twitter seriously. A lot of people know me solely from Twitter by now, but I really only use that site to troll. I don't really care if anyone hates my work. I'm very aware that it's extreme and provocative. I get the criticism about the writing being shit. Art and music are things I've done my whole life, and they're what I mainly want to put out there with the series. I've never done writing before, and telling a story with deep lore, etc. was never the point. However, there's definitely more to it. 
There's a bunch of hidden things in the episodes, from one-frame puzzles to clues in the audio design. I even think there's stuff people still haven't found. Seeing the community come together to figure out the name of the painter was really cool. There's more there even if it's not that deep. And while the presentation is a bit janky, mostly because English isn't my first language, it's one of my favorite aspects of the series. If I ever made a remaster of the series, I would keep all the spelling mistakes in. I like the camp. Lastly, hearing you say that I have talent made me really happy. Like I said, I've been enjoying your content for some time, and I hope I can create something that you can also enjoy in the future. Rob is a great guy, and I'm so glad to see his project grow. In fact, it might be the first analog horror series I decide to watch, thanks to how you talk about it. Rob is the guy who made Greylock, the, uh, the actually good analog horror series from Wendigoon's video. Well, not from Wendigoon's video. Wendigoon didn't just, like, spawn the series, but it's the other analog horror video he talked about in, in the video. And, you know, you could actually be fooled by this YouTube comment all you want. I mean, if you want to believe that he is 100% just trolling on Twitter and he doesn't believe anything he says on there, well, I mean, I guess that's cool with you. I mean, the way he talks on there is certainly like he's trying to get a rise from people. But that Reddit comment he made in his own subreddit, he hasn't mentioned using Reddit to troll, and he seems pretty genuine on his Reddit. And so, him saying that the pastor interaction was actually how he felt at the time, and how maybe he shouldn't have gone so hard, that implies that that actually is what he was thinking, and that he wasn't trolling. And so, that's why I genuinely think that he actually is super defensive of this slot. He'll put on a character and say that he's actually just trolling, but it actually just gives him free reign to mold in people's comments. And it's honestly understandable because he does put a lot of effort into the series. And so I wouldn't be surprised that he's super defensive of the stuff he makes. I hope he can actually like acknowledge that the writing in his series isn't good. Part of me doesn't think he actually believes it because he doesn't seem to be making an effort even in his later episodes to improve upon that. He's improved the means by which the art is made by adding different things such as the uh, such as the dispatcher call or the animation at the end of episode 8, but the writing hasn't changed at all, and he doesn't seem to be making effort towards improving that even though he says that he is trying to get better at everything. But I just don't think that what he's saying is entirely genuine. I know Wendigoon pinned it because he's just such a good-natured guy that he finds it impossible to, like, be mean to anyone, even if they kind of deserve to be put in their place. I don't believe he is a, entirely a troll. I think the way he acts makes him come off as a troll, but that's just because of how he is. And I think he knows that, and he's taking advantage of it to make people think that he's not being genuine when he actually is. I'd show you even more incidents of him acting like this troll persona, but this video would be way too long, and you've already gotten the point of how he is online. You know, do you think he's a troll? Do you think he's just a real moldy guy who knows that he can easily come off as a troll? You know, let, let me know about this. What do you make of this whole situation? I hope you at least know now that this has been Urban Spook the worst YouTube horror series that I think I've ever seen.